Hello and welcome to the International Schools Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Taylor, and on the podcast, we discuss all aspects of technology and life in international schools, with new episodes live every two weeks. We focus on people who are currently working in schools, and we talk about life in their current country and dive into some specific topics. The podcast is brought to you by Acer for Education. People always ask what Chromebooks we recommend and what Windows laptops we recommend, and after trying literally all of them, we always recommend Acer. If you'd like to get more info and try out some devices, please just go to gg.gg forward slash Acer Education. That's gg.gg forward slash Acer Education, and we'll get right back to you. Also, the podcast is brought to you by Apps Events. We're a Google partner. We work all around the world. We've just got one piece of new information right now. This is in, in January 2021. We're a G Suite Enterprise for Education partner. That's Giuseppe. This is a bunch of premium tools available to people using Google at their schools. We can help you get set up with a free one month trial. So please check out the link in the show notes and we'll do that right away. And now on to the interview. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Today, it's great to be talking to Derek Luby. Um, Derek's from in, currently in India, so we'll talk a little bit about that. And Derek's interesting because he was an educator and a, and a principal and then did an ed tech startup, which is interesting. I'm always interested in educator entrepreneurs. So Derek, welcome to the podcast. Thanks very much, Dan. Great to be here. Cool. So Derek, before we get into your startup, I'm really curious to talk for your, like, what, what, you know, how you got into education and where you work. And I especially want to talk about, you've been in Shanghai for quite a while. So I want to talk about living in, in Shanghai because a lot of, you know, one of the things about this podcast, people want to hear about different places they might be interested in working and what the life's like there, you know, just in the school, but yeah. also just living generally. So, so yes, yeah, so it seems like you you started up working in Shanghai. How, how did that come about? Uh, yeah, Shanghai was, I think, the third Fourth, actually, I guess, fourth location. So you okay. know, I started my international Looking at your LinkedIn, it's the first one. So that's what I'm looking at. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I started in uh, in Cairo, Egypt, back okay. in uh, 95. So I've been overseas for 25 years. Cool. Um, and I was a teacher there in 95 at AIS, and, um, or AES, sorry. And um, met my wife there, who's actually from Georgia in the United States. And then we continued our international kind of journey. And so we were in uh, Kaohsiung, Taiwan for five years. And from there went to Hangzhou, China and started the Hangzhou International School. I was the founder. Where were you in Taiwan, by the way, out of interest? Which school? Uh, Kaohsiung, the Kaohsiung American School. Oh, so okay. The- yeah, yeah. I work a lot with... Um- with Morrison in Taichung, so I've been, I've been to Taiwan, and we work with Acer as well, so Taiwan's one of my favorite places, I love it now. Yeah, yeah, we had, yeah. Uh, it, it's got a special place for us, so my wife and I, got, we have three daughters, and two of them were born in Taiwan, okay. so it's always got kind of a special home for us yeah, there, sure. for sure. And uh, yeah, and it's from Taiwan that we actually uh, then kind of made the short hop over to Hangzhou, China. I was the founding head of school at the Hangzhou International School, uh, spent two years there and then uh, moved to Shanghai with a kind of a sister school called the Shanghai Community International School. They were all part of the same family and uh, did a, did four years there, went to Budapest for eight years at the, um, you know, at the American School in Budapest and then came back to SCIS in Shanghai, uh, where I was the head of school um, back at my the original school. So I went from, you know, principal yeah. left, came back as a head. Uh, for four years. And that that uh, finished in June of 2020. So I, yeah. I got to deal with the tail, the beginning of the COVID uh, yeah, extravagant yeah. China, which was interesting. Yeah, we'll talk a bit about Shanghai. So what what um what's it like? I mean, I guess it's a big question, but like, what, what's it like? Do you, is it, I mean, obviously it's a big city, a lot of traffic. Is it, is it a good place to live? You think it from, for, especially like if you say someone like you with family and stuff, do you think it's a good place to live? We loved it. Yeah. We yeah. had a great time. And I think most families do it's, um, you know, I think 25, 30 years ago, it might've been a different story, a little tougher place to live, but you can, it's a, it's a, it's a very automated, it's a very phone based. I mean, I hate to say it, but everything's on an app. It makes life really easy. Yeah. Um, you, know, you can, you, if you have a family, you can of course have help with the house and help with the kids. If you have young kids, um, it's, they're extremely friendly people. Yeah. Um, 
So, you know, we, we, we loved it. And it's a very cosmopolitan city. It's just tons of things to do from any walk of life or any interest. So really tough to beat from that perspective. How does it work in terms of like most, do most people li live on accommodation provided by the school, like in the school or close by? Is, is that how it works normally over there? Yeah, most, most are, you know, off campus. I mean, different schools, of course, do it differently. So, you know, some of our, some in our particular school, some of our campus was in campus housing, but I think that was a small minority. A lots of it would be, you know, nearby apartments or, and then, you know, teachers, of course, find pockets of the city that they like. And so they tend to want to congregate here or live there or whatever. And that just depends yeah. on your, you know, personal preference. But, you know, I think most most of the um, international schools, if I could try to generalize, are, are, you know, their teachers are living in the city. They're not living in the school. Oh. What's it like? Um, I know most of the schools are kind of for profit. And I, and I know there's some of the school, the governance is kind of kind of quite strict and pressures on teachers. Like, how did you find the governance and stuff like working there? Like, what was it like? Was it was it what was the management like in, in terms of and was there a lot of like, because obviously, you know, you have to do, I think you have to do Chinese curriculum as well, don't you, as alongside the Western curriculum? Well, that really boils down to kind of what's your charter as a school. And right. so in China, there's lots of kind of, um, you know, nuances to that. And, yeah. and I don't know if I could speak intelligently to the various, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the various categories. You know, yeah. the schools I, I was working with were not, we did not have to teach the Chinese curriculum. Right. Uh, we, you know, fully accredited American schools that, um, yeah, but I do know, of course, depending on what kind of category you fall in, there were definitely requirements. And, and we also had requirements, uh, you know, from the Chinese government. It's not sure. launch, but, uh, but there are just different categorizations. And so I don't know if I would be intelligent enough to, uh, yeah. you know, to guess all of what those different nuances are. Right. And, and what about, um, the school, like, what was your school? I'm curious. Was it mostly local students or, or a mixture of locals and expats? Or? No, by, uh, China is very um, black and white in this kind of context. If you're an international school, you can take only international passport holders. So you really okay. cannot take local Chinese. Now, right. if you take the track, which is one of the categories we were talking about, now you can take local Chinese. And so right. a lot of even a few international schools end up running dual branches, if you will. They'll have a building for their international students, and they might even have an adjacent school and an adjacent building for their local students. Um, you know, and, and again, those would be run differently. There would be different curriculum requirements, et cetera. So yeah. the ours, ours was a purely international environment, uh, so we could not take Chinese passport holders. Uh, we had about 55 nationalities at uh, Shanghai Community International School when I was there. Cool. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, and would you, I mean, would you recommend it? Would you, I mean, if, if you were going to ever work in educate as a, as a principal again, do you, would you work in China again, do you think? Yeah. Yeah. I've, I, I, we loved our time in China. And uh, like I said, we, we've, we've had a very good experience kind of wherever we are. Right now, I'm not working in India. I'm a trailing spouse. My wife works here but at the American uh, Embassy School. But you know, thus far, we've really been fortunate to have um, enjoyed a lot, a lot of the places where we lived. And yes, I would heavily recommend China. It's um, each city is pretty different. And definitely there's a lot of diversity within the schools that exist. So, you know, you have to do a little bit of homework and you want to make sure you're talking with with people on the ground. But yeah. um, country and as, um, you know, as a, as as a place to be in a quality of life. Uh, yeah, I would give it a big thumbs up. I think now there's a particular challenge, frankly, with COVID, um, yeah. you know, and you probably know, you know, China is extremely diligent on that front and that has its pros and its cons. I, you know, I think a lot of teachers right now cannot and have not been able to leave China for a long time. Uh, you know, obviously that's troubling and concerning, but they've also been fortunate enough that I think basically life in China is pretty well back to normal, you know, that they've yeah, got yeah. the virus so locked down that, you know, people can go out and enjoy things. And, you know, the rest of the world is still struggling to do that. So definitely. And, and obviously yeah. you in India now, where, whereabouts in India did you, did you say you were? Uh, I'm in Delhi at the moment. Delhi. I haven't been, I was in Delhi. Oh, wow. Almost 30 years ago, the last time I was in Delhi. So <laughs> I imagine it's changed a huge amount since then. Yeah, I can't I can't speak to that much. And, you know, I think 
I would have to think my experience here is not atypical from anyone in the last 18 months um, in that it's been really hard to actually explore because of COVID. So, you know, we're all kind of living in this different environment now where uh, things are open in Delhi and you can go out, but it's it's really not the same. And I would imagine that's a similar story that you'd hear in other cities when, you know, yeah. as COVID hits. Uh, we, we, we probably, my wife and I have probably not been able to get around Delhi as much as we have other cities simply because there might be fewer things happening or there's, you know, kind of uh, added restrictions as things, you know, ebb and flow in terms of the virus. And sometimes it's on the, you know, sometimes it's at high alert and sometimes it's at low yeah. alert. And I, I think that's pretty, I would imagine that's pretty universal for the last 12 or 18 months. I think it's just been a struggle for anyone to to really, you know, get out and explore, especially in a new city where you're trying to, you know, connect and, and you know, make connections. Sure. And, and you mentioned your, your wife's an educator. Have you have you found it it helped, do you think, both both looking for jobs in the same school? And, and have you always managed it? Or, or would you say it's been a disadvantage? How have you found that general? Because a lot of, you know, teaching couples are looking to work abroad. Yeah, I, uh, I think it's helped us a lot. I mean, I, I tend to, uh, you know, it limits your matches for sure. Uh, but schools, I think, you know, for the obvious reasons, they kind of like couples. They're going to get one housing. They're going to get a little bit more probably longevity and stability. Um, and, you know, a city like Shanghai is offers a double opportunity just because there's so many international schools in a city like yeah. Shanghai that – it's possible. And it, it became very, um, you know, it's becoming a lot more common that, you know, one partner gets hired and maybe there's not a job, which is, of course, the drawback to being a partner. You know, you, you, there's not two openings at one school, but in a city like Shanghai, you can kind of put your resume out. And, you know, it's there's a lot of there's 40 or 50 other schools in one city to potentially land a job. So how, how did you do it? Did, did you both always work at the same school? Or did sometimes you or your wife end up working at a different school then? No, we were, we've always been together. Same school. Same. OK, so you always managed to get jobs at the same school. Yeah, I mean, I yeah. guess I guess it might mean one of you compromises on the job in some cases. because it's not it's unlikely to be two perfect ideal jobs for, for both people, I would I would think. Yeah, I, I'm a little fortunate in that, you know, my wife's an elementary teacher. That tends to be a broader job bank, you know, oh. so you know, there's usually an opening at schools for elementary. So I was a social studies teacher. Um, so, you know, there's, it's, it's a broad field, but not quite as broad as elementary. So we had two relatively um, flexible jobs to fill. And then when I became an administrator, you know, then it really boiled down to who has an opening for, you know, yeah. high school principal or head of school or whatever the post may be. Got it. Now, how, I want to talk a bit about your entrepreneurial journey uh, and how, you, how that came about. So what, how did that come about? We'll talk a bit about what, you, what, what your businesses or businesses are, but what, did you start thinking you wanted to try sort of a tech startup or something, something in education technology when you, when you were teaching? Yeah, yeah, I did. In fact, I did start this <laughs> in the uh, paper pencil version when I was teaching. And so... Um, it started a long time ago, and it is in the business world. We say it has pivoted since then, but uh, the beginnings of it was uh, I was an economics and social studies teacher, and uh, I was uh, teaching in in Taiwan at the time. So this was very early in my career, and I was teaching some uh, history and also some some uh, some stock market, some investing things like that, personal finance, and um, it originated from the idea that you know I was playing some simulations with the students where they got to invest fictional money into the real stock market. And, you know, there's a couple different simulations out there that do that. And you, you, you invest in Nike and Starbucks or whatever, and yeah. somebody wins and somebody loses after six weeks or whatever. And it was fun. It was totally engaging, but, but it also, I, I was fearful. It was kind of giving them the wrong impression. Like they were kind of just throwing darts at the board and, you yeah, know, yeah, sure. student win and he would think that he's a good investor because the darts he threw landed. And um, especially with a six week time frame to think about investing in six weeks, you know, um, which is not what experts would ever recommend. Sure. And so um, I started a kind of a simulation on my own, which is paper and pencil at the beginning, where I thought if we really want students to learn what a market means, a stock market means, and what investing really means when you're investing in the value of companies, then let's let's have students create a company. Let's have them each create their own company. And with paper and pencil, we can 
buy and sell shares. They kind of handed them in to me. And I had a big bulletin board back in the day, which was a big chart, you know, and you could every yeah. day I would change the share price. And I kind of said that I was the 99% of the investing public, but they were 1%. And so if everyone liked Dan's company, yeah, then yeah. of course, Dan got a little bump up the next morning, but you know, I, I still played the large you know, the group of investors that was probably more prominent anyways. And so it, it's when I started to tie that actually more into the curriculum is when I really got excited. And so I was teaching them investing and personal finance with this simulation. But then I started to think, well, hold on, I'm teaching history. You know, yeah. what happens if I make them create a business during the American Revolution in Boston in 1770, you know, yeah. and what would that entail when the taxes come from the British and how would you change your company? And, and they really started to buzz then. And because, you know, with each new variable that got thrown in, they were, they had to think, how does this affect my business? Do I need to change my business? And do I need to change my investment portfolio? How do, you know, I'm spending my money uh, investing in these other students' businesses. Does, is this variable, you know, a pro or a con for that? Yeah, yeah. And so, they would just start coming in and they were buzzing in the morning every day trying to change and edit their work and improve. And I was like, wow, this is, this has some legs to it. And I, this was back, you know, again, this is, uh, uh, by now it's probably like the year 2000. And so I created and I started to program that I hired programmers. I am not a coder, but, um, I started to map out the process and hired and created a site called Sim CEO, which yeah. stood for, know, class economy online or that little double meaning. You're your own CEO, but you're also part of this classroom economy online. Yeah. And it automated uh, an internal stock market like that. And we had some traffic. Let's jump in. I want to, like, obviously, I wanna, it's good to talk about the logistics. Did you, you said you, you hired coders, like, how did you use Upwork? Uh, and did you, uh, and how did you, how did you do that? And did you, like, know what, what, like, platform you wanted to build it on or, or, or and what did you build it? and I'm curious about what what the thought process was about getting into hiring someone did you have a budget like what, what was the whole process there yeah good questions um I think early on I went in fairly naively I mean I mapped it out I knew I wanted it built in Java I talked with a lot of tech directors and a lot of just people I knew in education that were yeah. savvy in tech um and there wasn't I don't think Upwork even existed then I think Fiverr was just coming around yeah it's a little cloudy, but I definitely connected with, you know, and I had to go through some coding teams. It was a lot of learning on the fly where like, I, yeah, it's always I, some trial and error. You got to stop people on small projects. I've, I've found out. Yeah. So I, I hired a few different teams and or I hired a team and I would work with them for two or three months or maybe even six months. And then, you know, we might hit a wall or there were technical difficulties. And um, so, you know, I had to bounce teams a few times, but being international makes that a little easier. And usually I was hiring, you know, people who local, like when I was in China, I was hiring a Chinese yep. team, working with them. Um, and then I would outsource some of the uh, smaller tasks to things like Fiverr, uh, graphic design, things like that, that yeah. I also can't say I have a, a skill, a specific skill set yeah, yeah. for. And so um, I kind of pieced that together myself. Um, I self-funded it. Um, so, yeah, and, so at this uh, point, is, there's no revenue and you just got costs, basically. You're just, you're just paying for the development. That's true. And yeah. so I started to to launch it, and it in and it um, I started to enter it in contests and things like that. I was fortunate by I think by the time I launched it, honestly, it took a long time to get moving. It was a very slow project. I mean, yeah. as you can well be aware, I mean, you know, I was a father to three. I was a principal. I was doing this at nights, and I would just make very slow progress. But it was all self funded, and it was more like a hobby and a passion project, yeah, yeah. really. Um, and so about 2000, probably about 2010, um, I, I really started to launch the site and try to share it and have, you know, and people started to use it. I how, entered how, how did you, how did you launch it? How did you get initial users? Uh, really, I just, I mean, it was, again, I was very naive. I had launched the site. It was active and visible. And yeah. I just started to do simple outreach, organic outreach. I didn't have a marketing budget. I didn't have sure. a marketing plan. Um, I certainly didn't have things like drip campaigns. I did have, uh, you know, mass, like kind of like MailChimp and large email lists. And as people would register, yeah. um, it was a free registration, you know, kind of thing. And as they would register and 
person, you know, consider buying credits. It worked on a credit system. So you'd buy your student, oh. a student one credit kind of thing. But, yeah. you know, as they registered, then I could, you know, they would be in my database and I could feed them emails. It was very organic. I mean, a little bit on social media. Um, but again, I was it's still really a passion project that was just taking shape. And and I would, you, I mean, did you get, I mean, so can you explain what, what they got, what they were paying for and, and who was your first customer, first customer? Did you get a few initial customers or? Yeah, we had, we had some, uni- we had K-12 schools. Um, I mean, my first customers were all my friends, you know, fellow yeah, teachers yeah. They weren't paying customers, but I would get them to pilot and use it. And, and, uh, some of them, even as of last year, were still using it. Um, but, you know, and then I remember started to get schools trickling in, usually from the states, actually, most of, I mean, a few international and then some universities started to use it. And it's really when the universities started to kick in um, that I started to get some feedback regarding a pivot. And um, I had two universities whose name honestly will escape me. One, one was in California, one was in Pennsylvania, yeah. who who just coincidentally were saying, there were smaller universities, but they were saying exactly the same thing to me at the same time. They said, we really like this. Um, This is great interactive learning. Our kids are creating solutions. They're getting feedback from each other on their solutions. Could could you build this out in a way that it wasn't only for economics or entrepreneurship? Could we use this for biology? Could we use this for physics? But um, was there so at this stage? Was there? I'm trying to see how how did it actually work? Was there some automation? Did it? Was there a bunch of historical scenarios you could select, and then they somehow did did some trading? How, how did it actually work in reality? I'm struggling to think sure. how, how it just to get my mind around how it actually worked. Yeah. The, the, the so you know picture picture a stock market ticker board as the beginning basis. Yeah. Okay. You know that's kind of the homepage, and really what it amounted to is the instructor would set the context. It was wide open. So like I said, you could say hey guys, we're going to be in Boston in 1770. You've already read the textbook. You know, chapter five is all about that. So, you know, your your goal is to create a company that you think will thrive in this environment. No, that could be one context. Another context when I was playing was, you know, hey, we're in Taiwan. You know, it's the year 2000. What business today, if you were a you know, a 15 year old student in which you are, <laughs> what yeah. would you found, you know, that you think would make money today so we could learn. And, and really what it is, is it's just building. So it's very wide open, but they're in essence, they're sharing their solution. And that solution took the form of a business plan. In each, so they write a business plan. Each- what happens? Does, is this, does the stock go up and down or like, how does, how does it so- work after that? So the business plan would be submitted and it's shared and then it's universal, just like it would be on, you know, Yahoo or any platform. Okay, you could yeah, yeah. company's business plan. As the instructor, I had a few different mechanisms. And I don't mean, I, I should say this, as the programmer of the platform, I gave the instructors a few yeah. different mechanisms. So you could, you could be kind of Orwellian, kind of dictatorial, and you could go in and set specific dates and specific prices for where you wanted those companies to be over the course of, you know, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks at each yeah. point if you wanted to. Um, I gave another one that just kind of was more general in its mathematical variability. And I might say, Dan's company gets four stars and Derek's gets three stars. And that was mapped to an equation, which would it would make your price fluctuate, but in general, over the long run, your price would be higher than mine. Yeah. But yeah. that's not taking into account student trading. So, you right. know, all these things that are instructor based uh, would be uh, independent of student trading and what impact those trades had, because each individual trade made an instant impact on the price. And right. then, like, the third option was just wide open. It was the instructor has no influence, no preference. Everyone starts at $20 per share. And let's see what the market does in terms of student shares, student okay. trading. I'm sorry. And got so it, the goal, the student, your goal was, I want to create the best company that ends with the best share price. And I want to be the best investor. I want my 10,000 fictional dollars to end yeah. up with the highest portfolio value. And those are independent goals, but obviously linked in this type of a platform. Got and it. so, yeah. So that's yeah, kind of so how I, I, know. I just looked at a website. I saw it wasn't active at the moment. Is that is that is that still going? Because you mentioned you pivoted. It I I had be, when I pivoted, I did not have the time to keep that going and develop the offshoot, which is called Huddle Up Learning. And right. so that pivot, that pivot for a while happened with 
as I said, these universities wanting to say, hey, could we use this in a more universal platform, not just for economics and entrepreneurship? And so if you did that, you know, Derek, could you build a grade book? Could you build a video conferencing chat? Could you build some of these tools? And we started to do that in hindsight, foolishly, that was, I think, a mistake I made. And after yeah. a couple of months, I was kind of like, wait a second. I'm, I'm, uh, you know, the analogy I like to use is I kind of had a school bus and someone was telling me, turn it into an RV, like a camper, put, put a bunk bed in there mm -hmm. and an oven, a sink. And it, and it just started to not fit. And so I said, if we're going to do this right, we kind of need to stop and create something from the ground up again. Yeah. And, and so I went out and got a little bit of funding from some um, investors, put a little bit more of my money in and started to create Huddle Up. And that's when I started to hit pause on SimCEO. I just couldn't maintain supporting users on SimCEO oh. and developing Huddle Up at the same time. Um, right. And so we do want to bring SimCEO back. Um, we just launched Huddle Up in July and it's just starting to, um, you know, uh, develop pilots and kind of take off. But, um, but right now, certainly um, I haven't given up on SimCEO by any stretch, but I just yeah. don't have the bandwidth right now to really, you know, monitor and, and take it to the next Great. level. So, so what's Huddle Up like? You, you're getting customers, are you? Are you looking for customers? And, and what, what, what would you say to people who might be interested? Yeah, very much. We're, we, as I said, we just... So what Huddle Up is, um, you know, and I almost need to clarify this. When I started with Huddle Up, it was, of course, a cla classroom platform, a learning platform, because uh, yeah. I believe in social learning, just like the concept of the stock market. We learn yeah. from each other. We learn when we create and we learn when we give feedback to one another. Yeah. That could be a stock market or it could be in in a, in Huddle Up. We do that in a variety of different ways, yeah. not just share prices, but qualitative and quantitative feedback on ideas. So yeah. I'm a big believer in kind of interactive PBL learning, you know, yeah. set a challenge, create a solution, see what others think about your solution via feedback. Yeah. Um, via feedback. Yeah. Um, round that are yeah. either started or getting going soon. Um, and we are looking for others. So if, if that model of learning is appealing to anyone, and I think in the international schools, hopefully will be, because I think we tend to have a little bit more freedom in how yeah. we, think about learning and what we what we want to do. But it's a very um, interactive, purposeful learning environment that is really, I just don't, I, I guess I became frustrated with online learning, you know, being so isolating and being so focused on videos and quizzes. It's such a superficial model of learning. And I wanted to, um, you know, build something that took the idea of the stock market, this interactive, purposeful environment where you're where you want to see how other people solved problems and yeah. get their feedback and um you know hopefully if we've done huddle up right we're building that in and so that's kind of the premise of it's a solution focused interactive environment what we what what i can say with educators is called interactive pbl some of the world right. maybe doesn't get that but that's in sure. essence what it is now did you so you this full time did you, what, what what happened did you decide to leave uh, education, uh, working for school full time to focus on this? Well, COVID helped me decide to leave, but right, yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't say it was all my decision, but at the same time, I'm, you know, in hindsight, I think I'm excited to be working on this and grateful for the opportunity because it's a, it is um, a significant amount of work and uh, to do it right, uh, you know, needs time and effort and energy and money. And so, um, um, I don't know how I would have been able to do this, maintaining my my old schedule of kind of working at nights, so to speak. Sure. You know, I, yeah. But a lot, a lot of teachers are thinking about doing an entrepreneurial activity. I mean, I, you know, I did it like part time, or they do it full time. Do you, is this what you want to continue? Do you think you'll work in education again, or do you do you want to go down an entrepreneurial path from this point onwards? It's uh, a good question. I, I miss being a part of a school, but right now my heart is in. I think I can make a much bigger impact with children and with learning um, and even with organizations and learning yeah. with, with this kind of an idea. And uh, I just, I think the way in which we're learning is a little bit outdated, especially the way we're yeah. learning online. It's a little bit outdated. Yeah. And so when I start to think about the impact I want to make, 
I love I've loved my positions in schools, but I feel like this has um, a much broader um, it's a much broader catalyst for change and change sure. this need kind of you know. Yeah, I mean, I guess. Do you think logistically the fact that you obviously you're married and, and and the other partner has has works for a school? Do you think that helped sort of soften the blow of you you starting this when there was sort of low income coming in in the beginning? Yeah, sure. I mean, anybody who has a working spouse is yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, when you're an entrepreneur and you don't have much coming in. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. Safety net of having a spouse who has, yeah. You know, uh, yeah, uh, I, it is difficult. I mean, I think for people who don't have that situation, it, it's hard. I mean, I, I've done it, but it's you've just got to be prepared to drastically cut down your lifestyle for, for a while. You know, I mean, like I say, I did it, but it's I didn't have children at the time, though. You know, and it gets I think it gets harder and harder when you do have children. You can still do it. I know people, plenty of people in their fifties started businesses, you know, with kids and everything, and still doing it. But it's just you know, it's just harder. You can't you can't pretend it's not harder. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So yeah. Good. So, so, so what's the future of a company? Like, what, what, what are you planning now? Like, what you, I know you look at, it says on LinkedIn, you're looking for funding or what are you, are you trying to get investors in it and things or what, what are you doing to grow? We're, we're, uh, we're raising around, we're just beginning, honestly, to raise around right now. And so, you know, we've been doing it with safe notes, which stands for a simple agreement for equity. Right. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll go out with either safe notes or convertible notes um, as a way we're, we're, um, we're kind of putting together that round right now. And that can come in small. The great thing about safe notes and convertible notes, as you may know, is they can come in small increments, yeah. 10, 20, 50,000 kind of increments uh, to build up into, you know, an entire funding round that can then launch. So obviously we're looking to take the next step here and get to what we think can be a series A uh, request for funding about 16 months down the road. But um, we're just now, we really want to establish some traction, prove the concept. Um, we're going to do that as slowly and as lean, as they say in business development, in lean language and agile terms, uh, as, as lean as we can. Uh, but but we're now, now that the development has resulted in an MVP that's launched in July, and now that we're starting to get traction with some pilots, uh, I feel like we're in a much stronger position to, to ask and, you know, and have some validated use cases um, of how schools are using it, how, how organizations are using it as well. No, um, I've never done fundraising before. And obviously, this is a whole different area of sales compared, like, you know, along with sure. selling to your customers. Like, how are you doing this? Like, are you using platforms like Angel or how are you actually getting investors? Convert? I mean, this is an area I know very little about. I mean, I know about it theoretically, but I've never, never done it myself. Yeah, you, you can you can put things on Angel. I've been on Angel. I've actually hired some of my people from Angel too. It's a great place to go if you're an entrepreneur, yeah. edupreneur, to uh, to find people who want to work with startups as well. Um, but you know, really, in 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 my understanding, the the funding process is a lot about what I'm trying to do is build relationships. Really, I mean, yeah. you can cold call and you can cold email people, and of course, you have to do your due diligence and find out who's a good match, you know, for my particular, you know, focus right now, it would be like an angel. Uh, we're going for a little over a million dollars. Um, yeah. VCs, that's a pretty small amount for some, most VCs are higher than that. And, uh, you know, the, the difference in my understanding is, you know, VCs are much more focused on uh, where a model is already existing, proof of concept is there, and, the, and it's really about the numbers. Now you yep. still need numbers when you're going after angel funding, but it but it's understood that you may not have the traction and you don't have the verifiable yeah, yeah. numbers. That you need yeah, the they're, they're, they're taking a bit more of a punt on the idea on the team and and, uh, and the market. Right. So so at the moment that's that's our focus, and right now what I'm doing is trying to just build relationships with folks who can add value. Because another part of the funding game is you can take money. Uh, but but what I'm personally really looking for is to work with partners who want to see the business explode, which is different than working. And they have the connections and the resources sure. and experience to help help facilitate that, which is different than, you know, accepting money. And, you know, someone says good luck uh, because you yeah. really want I, I am looking for someone with, you know, an ed tech background who believes in this passionately like I do that that learning needs to change and yeah. that this is a model for how teams and organizations and classrooms can learn. And right. there's a lot I still need to learn about, you know, 
business development and things like that. And that's why I'm, I want to make sure I'm with partners and funders that can, that want to be a part of that journey with me. Sure. Well, Derek, that's really interesting. What, um, it'd be good to talk again in a few months and see how things are going, you know, to ca- catch up again. How, um, where can people find you online? Where are you at? Where are you active online? And where should people go? Yeah. Our site is um, huddleuplearning.com. So one word, huddleuplearning.com. We blog at, you know, blog.huddleuplearning.com. And, yeah. um, you know, you, we're on Twitter at, you know, huddle up with the number two learn. And uh, you can, of course, I'm mildly present on Facebook, but my LinkedIn profile is much, you know, just Derek Luby. And we have a business LinkedIn profile. Yeah. I'm using I mean, LinkedIn more and more. Are you active on Twitter? I mean, I, I, I am, but I was more Twitter. Now I'm more LinkedIn. I say I'm in the same camp. I have yeah. used to be more active on on Twitter. And in the last year, I've really flipped and I've probably gone 90, 10 the other way. I do. I do yeah. a lot of outreach on LinkedIn and connections with LinkedIn. And it's been it's great. It's really great to, LinkedIn's great so. for making connections. It really is. And it's a good long term yeah. tool as well, you know? And obviously, when oh. you're connecting with someone, you can message them, and you can, you know, and, and I, I, I um, yeah, I, I like LinkedIn a lot. I, I didn't like it; I resisted it for a long time, but I've, I, I've, I've come around on it. Yeah, for sure. And I think in education, if you're an entrepreneur, definitely, 100, percent you should be on there. But even for educators, I think, especially if you're in leadership positions, I think it's a good way to network. You know, for teachers, I mean, it's still good for teachers, but I think it's more powerful for leaders in schools. Yeah, I've been, I've been. Honestly, I've been amazed how many connections I've made via LinkedIn in the last year. Um, just, you know, people like to connect and so do I. I mean, it's, it's good. It's good. It's a win-win for a lot of people. Yeah. You, want, you, you want to build your network and it's, it's been great to do that. Great. Well, look, Derek, thank you very much. Um, what, what time is it in India right now? It is 11.10 a.m. in India. Cool. Almost well, 7.40 here. I had an early start, so I'm going to go grab some quick breakfast. And a uh, pleasure to talk to you. And um, I look forward to catching up. Good luck with Huddle Up Learning. I'm sure it'll be a success. And let's talk Thanks. again. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate the opportunity. Have a great day.